On February 23, 2022, in the early morning hours, Tara Pakanik was sleeping at her home in Green Bay, Wisconsin, when suddenly she heard a slam from the storm door. Tara wasn't too worried because she thought it might be her son's friend, Taylor Shabiznis, leaving. She got out of bed and noticed that the basement light was on. Curious, she decided to go downstairs to see if her son, 24-year-old Shad Therian, was still there or if he had left with Taylor. Upon reaching the basement, Tara searched for Shad but couldn't find him. Just as she was about to return upstairs, something unusual caught her eye. A black five-gallon bucket placed on the floor right next to the staircase concealed by a towel. Tara lifted the towel and what she discovered was beyond anything she could have ever expected. It was her son's severed head. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Crime Weekly. I'm Stephanie Harlow. And I'm Derek Lavasser. So today we're diving into a case that actually just went to trial. So this happened in 2022, but this year it did go to trial and the trial gave us a wealth of information from body cam footage to obviously uh, court footage. We got to hear much more information. So I have been following this case for a little while and I did want to wait until it went to trial because there were so many unanswered questions that I feel like now we have answered. Yeah, I, I have not read the script. And as you were just doing the teaser, I was listening along with everyone else. And I, I said, damn, I didn't I didn't expect that one. That was a twist. So um, I don't have anything else to add. If you want to dive right into it, I'm interested to hear about this case. So Shad Rock Therian was born in Green Bay, Wisconsin on September 7th, 1997 to his parents, Tara Pakanik and Michael Therian. He grew up in the Green Bay area with two sisters and one brother and attended Bayport High School, but didn't finish school, stopping in 2015. During his time at Bayport High, Shad dated a fellow student named Taylor Coronado, a.k.a. Taylor Shabiznis, who he had known since middle school. Shad's father, Michael, later recalled that Taylor was polite during the time she dated Shad. Although the couple wasn't meant to be, they broke up after around two years of dating and remained friends for years to come. Now, we are going to talk more about Taylor here in a bit, but first, it's important to know what kind of person Shad was. His family described him as very kind and compassionate. He always considered others' feelings, often before his own. As an adult, Shad worked at his family's business alongside his father and grandfather, and in his free time, he enjoyed camping, playing games, wood carving, and spending quality time with his family. Shad had a deep love for music, often sharing links to songs on social media, and in the days leading up to his tragic murder, he spent quite a bit of time on Facebook posting various music videos and status updates. On February 20th, three days before Shad was found dead, he shared links to songs Live Your Life by T.I. and Rihanna, and That's All She Wrote by T.I. and Eminem. He also wrote cryptic status updates, which could have been evidence of Shad having a difficult day, like, quote, stay away because you're going to have a happier life than I am, end quote, end quote, shining in the night, that's all I really wanted. End quote. The following day, Shad posted only one status, saying, quote, wasted away again in Margaritaville, end quote, along with multiple music videos. This is the last day that Shad ever logged into Facebook, and his final post was a link to a song from the video game Kingdom Hearts. Today, many people online question if Shad's Facebook posts were about his ex-girlfriend Taylor, who he was still friends with. Taylor Denise Coronado was born on November 23, 1997 in Evanston, Illinois, to parents Arturo and Marla. She grew up in Chicago with both parents and her younger brother, AJ, and according to her father, Taylor was a normal kid who enjoyed playing volleyball and had many friends. In 2007, the Coronado family moved to Green Bay, Wisconsin because of Arturo's job at Verizon, and then only two years later, on May 20, 2009, Taylor's mom sadly passed away from cirrhosis and and alcoholism. Her death was unexpected as she and Arturo had spent the previous night watching a movie together before bed, and everything had seemed completely fine then. But when Arturo woke up in the morning, Marlo was dead in bed next to him, while 11-year-old Taylor and 9-year-old AJ were upstairs asleep, completely unaware of what was going on. After the siblings woke up, Arturo tried to get the kids to school, but they still knew that something was going on. 
And as one can imagine, Marla's death took a toll on Taylor, AJ, and Arturo, and Taylor started facing some difficulties at school, although nothing too serious, according to her father. He later testified about one incident where Taylor briefly took another student's musical instrument, but quickly returned it. We will talk more about that next week, but just know that Taylor also started struggling with her mental health at this time, which honestly, I think is to be expected, considering the unexpected death of her mother. However, it did seem to trigger something in Taylor that would change her and send her down a bad path. During her time at Bayport High School, where she dated Shad Therion, her behavior worsened and she was eventually expelled due to fighting. To help her get away from these issues, Arturo sent Taylor to live with her paternal grandparents in Texas, where she spent the next year and a half completing her schooling at Cotola High School. After graduating in 2016, she returned to Wisconsin and lived with her dad, and for a brief period, she attended Grand Canyon University, where she studied electronics and computers. In 20 in 2018, she began working as a machine operator at Saputo Cheese, and she also crafted and sold items like dream catchers, dog tags, and logos using beads, advertising them on Facebook. On February 11, 2020, Taylor left her job at Saputo Cheese, and three days later, she married Warren Edwin Shabao, a career felon with a record for armed burglary, theft, disorderly conduct, resisting an officer, dealing drugs, and domestic abuse. Taylor changed her last name to Shabusiness, while Warren changed his name on Facebook only, and they got each other's names tattooed on their necks. Arturo was not a fan of Warren, and he later testified, quote, he was was just a fucking loser and he got my daughter involved in that shit, end quote. And in this instance, by that shit, Arturo, Taylor's dad, meant meth. Another case, huh? We just finished a case involving meth and here we are, another one. Meth is bad, man. Terrible drug. It's I can tell worst. you, it, we, we didn't have much of it in my city where I worked, but we had a couple cases where it started coming up this way and I was really concerned about it because the stories I was hearing from down south not good. Once that stuff gets into your community, it's cheap. It's 10 times the high of, of crack cocaine. And it's something that people can make addictive. at home. Yeah, Highly addictive, but something that people can make at home, although very dangerous to do so. And that's why you end up having these homemade meth labs and a ton of people being dead inside because the fumes that come from it are completely odorless. Yeah. Or they just, they straight up explode, like up in flames. Or, or that. Yeah. yeah, that's the other option. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, meth is, uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I try not, you know, I've, I've dabbled in, in some drugs before, and I, try- <laughs> I thought you were just about to say <laughs> that you, you know, I've tried, I've dabbled in I've meth. Dabbled in meth. No, meth is one that I will never go near, simply because I've seen what it does to people. It completely changes them. It completely changes their personality. If you're that deep into meth, you don't care about anything. You don't care about your spouse. You don't care about your friends. You don't care about your parents. You don't care about your own children. All you care about is getting more meth. And it makes people do things that they never would do under ordinary circumstances. So whereas obviously most drugs affect your mental state, they can you know bring down your defenses. They can make you more you know likely to do things that in a an undrugged state you wouldn't do meth is on a whole new level it really does it does a lot of things and the people who are on meth have these like almost hallucinations they think like bugs are crawling under their skin they just go absolutely bananas and it's not good man it's not good i have known some people who can do meth recreationally and not get too carried away but they are the exception and not the rule when it comes to meth yeah people Okay. I'm yes. Not gonna go there. Yes, dude. I know a guy. I'm thinking of him right now, and I know that he regularly smokes meth, and he's just the same, and nothing's ever changed in him. But that, like I said, is the exception, not the rule. Everyone else I've ever known who's who's done meth has completely like changed. I mean, not just personality wise, their physical experience. I mean, you remember the this is the face of meth billboards, right? Yeah, I, that's what I'm saying. When you had said you had someone who's able to kind of stay right in that zone yeah not go too far i mean you're right they're definitely exception to the rule because usually that stuff gets you hooked in and it's game over yep absolutely and um it is it's uh, probably much bigger now much more prevalent now than when you were working narcotics with the uh with the police yeah like i said i worked with the dea task force and, and we mainly cocaine heroin weed to a lesser extent um that was the main choices of drugs up here um, but we'd have a couple cases where 
we had some shot callers in the community who were trying to get meth up here because of, for the reasons I just said. Yeah. They could cook it at home. Cheap. Super, super inexpensive and smaller amounts. 10 times the high. So basically and you get, all you get things. basically a built-in customer base for life, right? Because yeah. these people get so addicted, they will continue coming back to you. Yeah, the problem the problem with meth uh, uh, amongst all the normal issues that come with using a drug like that is you, when you have people doing it at home and using their cutting agents, they start to cheapen the substances mm-hmm. that they're using to make more of a profit and that just like heroin and that's when you end up with a lot of people ODing because they don't even know what's in they don't know the components that are being put into the drugs as fillers uh, and then you get a bad batch and you end up with a lot of dead people in your community or you'll have like somebody consistently using meth that's been cut and diluted so much and then they'll get that one batch that wasn't cut as much and they don't have the tolerance for that yeah. Uh, what about when you were when you were working in narcotics? Was fentanyl big then like it is now? <sighs> fentanyl was just becoming very big. It was mm-hmm. something where we were going to a lot of schools for because, again, it's one of those things where fentanyl, just this, if you smell it, it can completely destroy your lungs in a matter of seconds. Damn. Um, I remember they used to always show us this video of this patrolman who was searching a car and he found these glass jars in the in the trunk of the vehicle and they were they looked empty and he opened one of them up Why? and smelled it. You can actually I got a. I wish I knew the the video. Um, maybe someone out there has seen it. Maybe this former law enforcement. But he opens the jar, he smells it, and all of a sudden his head just snaps back and he hits the ground. <gasps> he ground. He burned like seventy percent of his lungs in a matter of seconds. What? Yeah, from fentanyl. Co- did he recover? He no. He has a, he's like breathing issues now to this day. Like oh, he was no. he was injured on duty. Like done after that. And fentanyl. Yeah. I mean, even if you touch it. So we would go into these drug houses where there'd be like cooking stations and stuff. And even if you just touch it with bare skin it can absorb that way you don't even have to ingest wow. it and you can you can have an overdose just by touching it that's crazy really yeah. bad shit really bad shit for us and then obviously for the people out there who again using they're using fentanyl to use as a cutting agent mm-hmm. and these drugs the kids or the make adults a lot don't of sense know. to me well it's cheap it's cheap and it, it, it gives that a high so it, yeah. it gives the illusion of a higher high if it's used properly but there's such a fine line there where if yeah. it's too much, then you kill your customers. And mm-hmm. so, and these drug dealers don't care. So yeah, no, fentanyl was becoming a big component uh, when I was on the way out from narcotics. So fentanyl and meth, stay away from them. I mean, stay away from all of them, but if you're going to do something, you know, don't choose those. Don't choose those. Yeah. yeah. The rest, you know, do what you got to do. Oh God, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> but- I knew you were going to, you're like, I mean, you know- well, I mean, like, you know, like, experiment, but like, those are two, I would just say like, you can experiment with drugs. Don't get like hooked onto things, but those are two drugs that it's like, I don't feel like you can experiment with them and just use them recreationally, you know? So anybody who come into crime con, who came to crime con, cause this will come out after, I'll have a poster child for why you shouldn't use drugs. It's going to be the person standing next to me, Stephanie Harlow. When she, when you, like I said, when you see her sitting there rubbing the walls, cause she feels like they're moving. Am I a poster child for why you shouldn't use drugs or yep. why you should? Don't do drugs, kids. I'm successful. Do dr- and where's, where's Stephanie? She's under the table. Dazzlingly the intelligent. What am I taking that I'm at crime? Like, am I what, on LSD or something? I don't know. I don't know. What, you- what am I'm I kidding. licking the carpet for? I, I'm kidding, guys. I am the poster child for why. Some drug use is perfectly fine. Then I'm still intact. But only when she uses drugs. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps me regulated. Keeps her regulated. <laughs> Otherwise, she's a mess. All I mean, right. We, before, weed's not bef- drugs, okay? So stop. Yeah. Don't use drugs, kids. That's what we're saying here. Yeah, yes. But uh, before we dive back into it, let's take our first break. Okay. How many of you wish there was a better solution to paying off your debt? PDS Debt has customized options for anyone struggling with credit cards, personal loans, collections, or medical bills. With rising interest rates and the cost of living at an all-time high, now is the time to finally take initiative with your debt. Stop waiting and start saving with your own custom debt savings options from PDS Debt. PDS Debt is giving our qualified listeners a free debt savings analysis just for completing the 30-second online debt assessment at pdsdebt.com crime. You will receive a full breakdown on how to save on interest each month and the quickest way to take care of your debt. 
If you're making payments every month on your debt and your balances aren't going down, this program is for you. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into one low monthly payment. Everyone with over $10,000 or more in eligible debt qualifies and there is no minimum credit score required. Bad and fair credit are both accepted. You can save thousands in interest and fees and pay off your debt in a fraction of the time with PDS Debt and Derek's going to tell you how you can get started. That's right. PDS Debt is offering a free debt analysis to our listeners and viewers just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment at www.pdsdebt.com slash crime. One more time, that's pdsdebt.com slash crime. PDS Debt has been a longtime supporter of the channel. So if you want to support us, make sure you support them. On June 21st, 2020, four months after marrying Warren, Taylor had her first serious run-in with the law. That day, police received calls about Taylor walking around a neighborhood and knocking on doors, and when officers approached her and asked what she was doing, she said she wasn't sure. She was on a different planet right now. She also displayed track marks on her arms and explained that she had just taken drugs. Then, according to a criminal complaint, Taylor became argumentative and attempted to walk away from the police straight into oncoming traffic. An officer prevented her from doing so, and while another officer was trying to check Taylor's information in the county database, she continued to make strange and nonsensical comments, even asking one of the officers, are you taking a shit? Taylor continued saying things like that and at one point tried to walk back into traffic. An officer stopped her and she started kicking at him, and when another officer came to help, she tried kicking at him too. Consequently, Taylor was arrested and charged with battery on an officer and resisting or obstructing an officer. She was later released on bond. Just two months later in August, Taylor got into trouble once again when she led an officer on a high-speed chase after he attempted to pull her over for speeding. She ran red lights and at one point almost hit a biker, so officers attempted a pit maneuver to stop her, but Taylor evaded it and fled into a parking lot at her father's residence. What is a pit maneuver? So basically, when you're when you're following, when you're chasing someone in a car, what you want to try to do is throw the car that you're pursuing off balance. So what they'll do is I'm trying to the best way to describe this. Maybe we can throw up a little video here or something. I don't know, Shannon, you figure it out. But. Basically, what you want to do with the front passenger side of your cruiser, slightly push the back driver's side rear quarter panel of the offender's vehicle. And by doing that, those those rear wheels come off balance and it usually causes the 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 offender's vehicle to spin out of control back in the direction of you. Now, if you do a controlled pit and it works out perfectly when you smack the back quarter panel of their car their vehicle should spin around and you should be able to kind of pin it up against wherever you're at at that point where the vehicle comes to a stop and you're good. The problem with pit maneuvers, especially at high rates of speed, is we've actually seen offenders killed where the pit maneuver is not performed correctly, the car doesn't spin around like it's supposed to, and they end up flipping out of control and dying from their injury. So unless you have someone who's fleeing the area who's a danger to the community if they get away... I think pit maneuvers are becoming less and less prevalent because of how the dangerous nature of them. Although I will say down south, they're pit maneuvering everybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, Up north, we're not even allowed to chase vehicles anymore unless it's like, again, for a serious crime. But in most instances, as a sergeant, if 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 you were chasing someone for a traffic infraction, as a sergeant back at the station, I'm calling it off because the risk to the other members of the community during that pursuit are not worth apprehending that person for that violation. Especially if you're in Taylor's condition. Obviously, she's under the influence of something. So she's not going to be worried about the other drivers, pedestrians. She almost hit a biker. So that's it. Probably the less you want to like cage her in, the less you want to make her feel pursued, the more you want her to slow down. She's going to drive. Yeah. You want her to slow down. So, yeah, I, you know, but again, down south, you know, different world down there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, officers arrested Taylor upon her exiting the vehicle. And when they searched the car, they found meth, a syringe, an elastic band and cotton balls. As a result, Taylor was charged with fleeing, eluding an officer, resisting or obstructing an officer, bail jumping, and possession of drug paraphernalia. She was released on bond again, but with conditions including she had to wear an ankle monitor and a farm chem drug patch. Do you know what a farm chem drug patch is? I don't. 
So apparently this is a sweat patch that is successful and an economical device for long-term and continuous drug testing. It's designed to be minimally invasive drug testing system that offers court-supported dependable detection of the most common drugs of abuse. Um, They offer comprehensive testing solutions for adults and juveniles, uh, for probation, parole, substance abuse course, and reentry recovery program and workplaces. That's crazy. I didn't even know that existed. Well, now you do. A single patch provides 24-hour sample collection for 7 to 10 days. So what do you think they do? They put it on them and then remove it? Yeah, I'm assuming it's not like... I'm assuming it doesn't yeah, have like, like, sending, a like signals. internet-based chip in it that's like communicating back to them. So yeah, they can probably take it off and download it. Sure. Download it, you think? Yeah, like once they pull it off of her, they can pull the data off of it or maybe it's they test it. I think they test it like with yeah. chemicals, right? Yeah. So if there's no type of microchip or some type of data retrieval processor on there, then it's probably, yeah, like you said, they just dip in it. Maybe it's just a really... I don't know, basic testing thing where it's like, hey, if your skin, you know, if this patch absorbed any of these substances from your skin, it'll show up in the patch. We dump the patch into some type of fluid. And if it goes blue, you popped. If it goes pink, you're good or something, something as simple as that. Yeah, that's crazy. I'm sure people in the comments are going to weigh in on that one. I'm sure people have experience. We have a lot of people who've had issues in the past or know someone who has. And I, I have a feeling someone will be educating us on all the uh, the details of this chem patch and how it works. I feel like it would be easy to like get around that though. Couldn't you just take it off and then put it back on? I don't think you can. It's no. probably one of those things where it's like there's some type of tamper system in place. Or where you if would you be able to tell, it, yeah. Yeah, where like if you remove it and there's probably a specific way that it's done, you can tell that it's been tampered with. So let us know in the comments. Uh, I can guarantee you someone's going to be filling yeah. us in. How does it actually give results? Like, how do you know if somebody's used drugs? Is it like connected to some system or is it just like a test that once they collect the patch from you, they can now test it to see if you have used any drugs? And would it be easy to take off and then put back on right before the police show up to take it? I would hope it wouldn't be that easy. Well, a few months later in November, Taylor's husband, Warren, was stopped by police officers in a traffic incident during which they discovered 46 grams of meth. That's a lot of meth. He was arrested and charged with possession of meth, violating his probation and bail jumping. I feel like if you have 46 grams of meth, you're not just possessing it. You're probably selling it. Am I wrong? That sounds like intent to distribute to me. Right. Wait, well, he mean, didn't get charged with that, though. But. 46 grams is it is a lot. It's more than personal use. Yeah. But the argument could be made at that amount that you're using it over extended period of time. It's not like a thousand grams, you know, but I mean... It's it's definitely it also depends when you're deciding to uh, tend to distribute or personal use how it's packaged. You could have 46 grams that All is in, in one bag, bag yeah. and that could be that could be you could say that's personal use, but if you have one big bag and all 46 grams are all in individual grams and little plastic bags themselves, well now that's intent to distribute. Well check this out. Officers then went through Warren's phone and learned that he was part of a group that was selling large quantities of meth around Wisconsin. A federal investigation ensued, and according to a criminal complaint, Warren was ultimately charged with conspiring with others to distribute 500 grams or more of meth. In the end, Warren ended up taking a deal where he pleaded guilty to possession with intent to deliver, and he was sentenced to serve a few years in federal prison. Warren later claimed on Facebook that he had been framed and that he, quote, beat a conspiracy to distribute methamphetamine charge and pled to a possession with intent to deliver charge. What's the difference between distributing or selling and intent to deliver? Honestly, every state is different. I know in Rhode Island, there was possession with intent to deliver or there was simple possession. I don't remember there being, there could be a conspiracy charge tacked onto that where if there's multiple individuals involved with the intent to deliver, you would they would all be in charge. Yeah. They would all be charged That's the conspiracy with the intent. Part. Yeah. But I don't completely understand what he's trying to say there. Maybe in addition to the possession with intent to deliver, he had also been charged with conspiracy because there was multiple co-conspirators, which could be a bigger charge, maybe even federal because it would involve multiple people potentially from multiple states. So maybe he's saying he beat the conspiracy charge and just had the simple possession with intent to deliver for himself. I was also wondering if it had something to do with like the exchange of money, you know? So let's say somebody bought meth, paid someone, and then Warren is just dropping it off. 
Yeah, so that would so Warren would be the person he could be charged with conspiracy. Although he's not doing the actual hand to hand, he is still part of the process and therefore could be charged with conspiracy. And with the conspiracy would come any charge that your co-conspirator was being charged with, just like a murder charge, yeah. right? You could be the person who supplies the gun. This guy goes and kills him, comes back to you, gives you the gun back, you get rid of it. Well, if that person gets convicted of murder and you're convicted of conspiracy, well, you're then you're charged with the first degree murder as well, even though you didn't pull the trigger. So sometimes people think that just because you're not the main figure in the crime, uh, you're going to get away with it or, or you're, you're going to get a lesser sentence. Somehow, yeah. It's almost like a robbery. Like, oh, I was just a getaway driver. Well, guess, listen, if you were a, a, an item or you were an element to that crime, you could be charged just as harshly as the person. You could be even in a situation where you conspire to commit a robbery of a gas station, right? Your co-conspirator goes in. He carries out the robbery and ends up shooting the the person yes. running the cash register, even though that wasn't the intent at the time. That wasn't the plan. Well, guess what, buddy? If you're driving the car, you could go down for murder one as well just because of the actions of your co-conspirator. So, yeah, I think that might be what he's saying. And, yeah, for Warren, just being the money guy, you can be charged just as he- harshly as anybody else involved. Well, throughout this You know, throughout all of Warren's legal troubles, Taylor was a real stand by your man kind of wife. And she often mentioned his incarceration on Facebook, once sharing a picture depicting a man in an orange jumpsuit kissing a woman as he's being taken away by a police officer. And the caption reads, quote, forever, question mark, forever, end quote. (laughs) Weirdo. Sorry. (laughs) It's the glamorization of. Going to prison, you know, that Bonnie, that's like, it's that Bonnie and Clyde syndrome. Yeah, except, you know, Bonnie and Clyde weren't hopped out of their minds on meth. So mm-hmm. it's almost like this thing where you remember the World War II picture where like there's a soldier going off and his wife is like kissing him goodbye and he's holding her and her like leg is up. And like that's that's a sweet, a sweet thing. Like he's going away. He's going to war. He may not come back. This dude's going to prison <laughs> for distributing meth. And she's like, I've got your back, honey. Like it's poetic. you're mine. You it's are great. the you are the most amazing man ever. I love that you provide for us. <laughs> I love that you provide for us both money and meth. Mm-hmm. The two M's, the most important M's. After Warren's arrest, Taylor started breaking the rules of her electronic monitoring. Surprise, surprise. And in January of 2021, she removed her ankle monitor altogether. And even though she got caught, she repeated this action a month later. Around the same time, Taylor became pregnant, apparently with Warren's baby. Now, this baby was given the last name Coronado. Court documents say that Warren is the father, but based on the time, we're not really sure how that that would work out unless Taylor and Warren were having conjugal visits of some kind. Otherwise, probably Warren was not the father of this baby, but apparently um, that is what Taylor claimed at the time. In June, a pregnant Taylor was scheduled for a court appearance for a battery against an officer and other offenses, but she didn't show up and a warrant was issued for her arrest. A few days later, she attended court, the warrant was canceled, and she was allowed to remain out on bond. Court records show that in August, Taylor pleaded no contest to fleeing slash eluding an officer, resisting or obstructing an officer, and battery against an officer. The other charges were dropped, and she received a three-year probation sentence and three months in jail. However, this was reduced to house arrest with an ankle monitor. I'm not sure why this woman keeps getting all of these like light sentences and being able to just go on house arrest and stuff because she's clearly a repeat offender. She's clearly like one of those, you know, I am no longer in control of my life kind of people because she's having multiple interactions with the law. She's trying to attack police officers. She's like leading them on car chases. She's constantly found with drugs her her husband's in prison for distributing methamphetamine, and we're just going to keep letting her go and putting an ankle monitor on her and hoping she keeps it on. Yeah. Welcome to my uh, my world. This well, is not, not your world anymore. <laughs> not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore, that's for sure. But was my world for a very long time. Something I dealt with all the time. I, the only argument that can be made is that these crimes that she's committing, for the most part, I'm more of a detriment to her than society. I mean, but my argument to that would be when you have this amount of narcotics in the area, usually it leads to more larcenies, more assaults, more rapes, 
more yeah. murder. And so there's there's other effects from the, the methamphetamine being out there, and she is contributing to that. Uh, but that's not how the judicial system always sees it. Well, she's they doing believe- things that like she's attacking police officers. So if she's going yeah, to attack police, don't police count. but if she's going to attack police officers, which most logical people would say, that's probably not the person I want to attack if I'm going to attack someone. What's yeah. to stop her from attacking anybody else that gets in her way or anybody else that pisses her off? She's going on car chases and almost hitting bikers. Clearly, this person is like not in their right mind. Yeah, that is one way of looking at it. And that's you know, how, how I used to look at it, but I will say when, when it was an assault on a PO or um, resisting arrest or anything like that, the judges definitely looked at it differently in, in Rhode Island, at least. They, there wasn't as much of an issue for them. They kind of looked at it as like, hey, that's kind of, that's part of their job. Well, let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. Raise your hand if any of this sounds like you. You obsessively follow that super credible health expert on TikTok. You take all the latest supplements your almond mom recommends, even the ones that don't taste so great going down. You embrace the latest diet craze that your best friend swears by, whether it's eating no carbs, all the carbs, or only carbs that grow on trees. And you follow your coworker's nine-step skincare routine plus an eight-step hair grooming routine every night religiously. You listen to these health-obsessed folks, but when was the last time you went to an actual good Good doctor, like in real life with real medical experience and a stethoscope. If you have to think about that, it's time to head to ZocDoc. There are thousands of top rated doctors on ZocDoc. They're all listed with verified patient reviews so you can find and book a doctor who not only has years of experience and an actual medical degree, but also gets you. ZocDoc is a free app where you can find amazing doctors and book appointments online. And we're talking about booking appointments with thousands of top-rated, patient-reviewed doctors and specialists. You can filter specifically for ones who take your insurance or who are located near you and treat almost any condition that you're searching for. And the average wait time to see a doctor booked on ZocDoc is between just 24 to 48 hours. That's it. Sometimes you can even score same-day appointments. And once you find the doctor you want, you can book them immediately with just a few app taps, no no more waiting awkwardly on hold with a receptionist. So I personally have used ZocDoc and it is as easy as it sounds. It's a really good thing for me because I tend to put off going to the doctor. So when I can get an appointment that same day or the next day, it actually forces me to go because I'm not having it looming ahead of me weeks in advance and I can't find a reason to put it off. So I really do like ZocDoc. Like I said, it's as easy as they say it is. And Derek's going to tell you how you can check it out for yourself. That's right. Just go to ZocDoc.com slash Crime Weekly and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top rated doctor today. Once again, that's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash Crime Weekly. One more time, ZocDoc.com slash Crime Weekly. In October, Taylor gave birth to a son named Mateo Coronado, who later went to live with his paternal grandparents in Texas. Two months later in December, Taylor continued talking about how her husband was in prison, sharing a Facebook post that read, quote, I have an eight in two weeks. His bond money comes first, end quote. Hashtag loyal. First of all, it's Eden. I haven't eaten in What did she say? I haven't eaten in two weeks. She hasn't eaten in two weeks. You would be dead, Taylor. You can't not eat for two weeks. His his bond money comes first. Good Lord. She added the caption, truth. By January 10th, 2022, Taylor's relationship with Warren had apparently deteriorated. As she wrote on Facebook, quote, double crossed my loyalty. That's one thing you'll never get back. Let's play. End quote. I'm not sure how he double crossed her loyalty in prison. What was he doing in prison? Like, is he cheating on her in prison? Like, what is he doing in prison that's not being loyal to her? I'm not sure. But I'm also not surprised that when your husband's in prison for, you know, distributing drugs, that your relationship might (laughs) deteriorate. I mean, maybe she maybe he had other people visiting him in prison. Maybe she got wind that other women were visiting him at uh, at prison and bringing him gifts or whatever. I don't know. Conjugal visits. I don't know. Damn. It's like some Goodfellas stuff. Remember that scene in Goodfellas when she goes to visit Ray Liotta in prison, his wife, and she sees like his mistress just visited him and she just like loses it. And that's when she starts working with the feds to like turn on him. I'm saying we don't know. She might have found something out while he was in there that he was making calls or having visits from other women. And that will that'll do you in Mm, three days later. There's a record of that. Three days later, she posted, quote, 
I got hitched to show them my commitment, loyalty, and dedication to them. That was never going to be how I used to be. Then they turn around and fuck on me. There's no way I'll ever go into another relationship. Hashtag can't trust no one. End quote. I mean, if you can't trust your husband when he's in prison, when can you? When can you? Her last ever post came from that day and read, quote, went off and told an addict I'll never stop buying you dope so I could sit back and watch you die, end quote. Huh, this post is eerie, considering what would happen just over a month later. On the snowy night of February 21st, 2022, 24-year-old Shad was at his mother Tara's house. He usually lived with his dad, but often went to his mom's place to eat and do laundry. At around 9.30 p.m., Shad was picked up by Taylor and Alex, A.J. Gannon, another friend from middle school. The trio went to buy drugs and returned to Taylor's apartment on Eastman Avenue, where she lived with a 53-year-old man named Scott Thomas, and they planned to hang out at her apartment that night and smoke marijuana and meth. When the police later talked to AJ, he said everything seemed okay during their hangout. At some time past midnight, Taylor took a picture of Shad on her phone and gave him a haircut. Not long after, AJ left and Taylor injected herself and Shad with trazodone. They then drove back to Shad's mother's house and went straight to the basement, never making any contact with the mother, Tara. On the 22nd, Tara never went down to the basement, but she assumed both Shad and Taylor were there because she heard Taylor's voice and saw her van outside. Then sometime between 2.30 and 3 a.m. on the 23rd, Tara heard a loud slam from the storm door on the side of the house, located at the top of the basement stairs, and a car starting. Tara didn't think much of it. She figured Taylor had left for the night. She got out of bed and saw the basement light was on, so she went downstairs to check to see if her son, Shad, was still there or if he had left with Taylor. But Shad was nowhere to be seen. As Tara was about to go back upstairs, she noticed a black five-gallon bucket on the floor next to the stairs covered with a towel. Tara lifted the towel and found Shad's severed head. Which, like, can you imagine... Can you imagine? Because never in your wildest dreams would you think that that's what you were going to find, right? And knowing me, I would not have looked in that bucket. You know, my son lives down in the basement. He's kind of like hanging out down here. I don't want to know what's in that bucket, you know, because most likely he put it there. I don't want to know what's in the bucket. I don't want to know what these boys do by themselves in the basement at night. I'm not going to look in the bucket. But to look in the bucket, not even expecting that that's a possibility, not even on your radar of something going to find, and seeing your child's severed head in there. I imagine you would never, ever, 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 ever unsee that. So they were down there for a full, doing the dates here. Obviously, Shad was picked up on the 21st. Mm-hmm. Then on the 22nd, Taylor and Shad are back at Tara's house, mm-hmm. presumably most of the day, right? Because she said she saw Taylor's car or van, I should say, out in the driveway. Yes. So they're basically almost at at Tara's house for a full 24 hours, right? Yeah, they were there qu- for quite a while. Okay. All right. And then um, early morning, the 22nd is, uh, the 23rd is when they see, when this all happens. Yeah, 2.33 a.m., Tara hears Taylor leave. She goes downstairs to see right. if Shad left with her because, you know, they're probably in and out, and then finds that. Okay. All right, I'm with you. Tara rushed upstairs and woke up her boyfriend, Stephen Hendricks, and told him what she discovered. At first, Stephen had a hard time believing Tara, thinking she might be going through a mental episode, but he went downstairs and looked in the bucket anyway. He couldn't figure out what was inside, but Tara was adamant about what she saw. So Stephen called the police, dialing the non-emergency number just in case there wasn't really a head in the bucket. Which I I assume that it would be very difficult to, like, wrap your mind around at that point. You know, like, you have to be convincing yourself, like, this isn't real. This is, like, maybe they made, like, a paper mache head for, like, a Halloween prank or something. Or they're just doing, like, an art project. Like, this can't be real kind of thing. Because how would you even process that? Yeah, I I don't know. I don't know how – I don't know how he wouldn't be able to tell as well by looking in the bucket. But – I feel like your your brain would be trying to almost protect you from it, you know? I guess. Yeah, I guess it could be so graphic it almost looks fake and he thinks maybe it's a prop or something. Brown County Public Safety, how may I help you? Uh, we have a sad looking officer at 829 Stony Brook. Um, her friend just woke me up to swear that she found her severed head of her son in the base. I have no clue what's happening with my girl. Swears that she found her severed head of her son in the base. Down there? In a bucket. I went down. I can't tell what the fuck. I 
part of my language. I'm kind of a little freaked out. Okay. Did she just wake up and say that? Yeah. And who is, who, who, whose head is it? She's claiming it's her son. How old is her son? 24, 20, 25. Has he been missing or? No, he was here yesterday with some chick and then now all of a sudden nobody's here. And she came up to use the restroom a couple times. And she keeps calling and calling and now she's saying that she hears the phone down there too. Okay, is she with you right now? Yes, I won't. Yeah, she's up there. She's a little freaked out and I don't know what to do. Okay, all right, stand in line. And um, you said you went down there, correct? Yeah, and I looked at the towel, but I can't, I, I can't see very well, and I can't tell what the hell it is. So there's something in the bucket. There's right something in the guy. There's something in the guy's dead bucket. There. Okay. Hello. If she ran up again, I, I, I don't know what the hell, man. Do you think she's hallucinating, or do you think that? I don't think so. I went down and there's something in the damn bucket. <laughs> and I, I can't. I, I don't know, man. And she's a little freaked out and. Kind of freaking you. All right, so it, it sounds like what you were saying. We're basically, it's one of those situations where he's woken up from a, from a dead sleep and he's told something that's not something he, that's easy to process even when you're fully awake, maybe dark in there or whatever. So he looks quickly, obviously doesn't look like the movies and maybe the way the head is positioned in there, he can't immediately tell what it is and he just calls police before, you know, he probably didn't want to touch it. So I can understand that. So that makes sense. I could see how he knows something's in the bucket, doesn't look normal. He can't figure out what it is. And he, he just woke up to this. So he's kind of like, hey, you tell me what to do. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I just I just got woken up to this. And I don't know how long they were dating for, but he didn't even know how to spell her last name. So it couldn't have been that long, I would hope. Yeah, they both seem pretty um, casual about it, honestly. But like I yeah. said, I'm sure she's in shock because I, I thought I heard her say, like, I'm 100 percent that it's my son's head in that bucket. Yeah, she seemed pretty convinced. Yeah. So but she she also seems like super calm, which I just don't know if I if I would be. But hopefully that never happens to me and I never have to find out. So at 3.37 a.m., two Green Bay police officers arrived at Tara's home on Stony Brook Lane. What happened next was all caught on their body cameras. The two officers walked up the driveway and met with Tara, who opened the side door off of the driveway. The officers entered a landing and were met with two options, go left into the kitchen or straight down the stairs to the basement. Initially, the officers stood in the landing and talked to Tara and Stephen, who were in the kitchen. They repeated what they'd already told the dispatcher. Tara had found a head in a bucket at the bottom of the stairs. One officer stayed in the kitchen while the other, Alex Wanish, went downstairs to the basement, at this point doubting that Tara had really found a severed head. Wanish quickly located the bucket, lifted the blanket off, used a flashlight to look inside, and to his surprise, he saw a severed head. He called the second officer downstairs to verify, then they informed their supervisors that there was in fact a head and requested more units. The officers continued to check the bucket multiple times to be sure of what they saw. Then the one officer went back upstairs while Wanish explored the rest of the basement, which was like a storage unit filled with various items like a Pac-Man arcade game, a cat scratching tree, a lamp. There was also a mattress on two box springs without sheets, but with a comforter on top situated in the middle of one side of the basement. Wanish approached the bed and noticed a large amount of blood on the pillow, along with chunks of flesh and blood on the floor near the mattress. After looking around and finding no one else there, Wanish took one last look at the bucket, exhaled, then went upstairs to start securing the scene. Yeah, those, those situations are always really difficult. I'm actually thinking of a couple scenes that I walked into where it's almost like you watch movies a lot. And then when you walk into the scene, it looks like it's something you've already witnessed before. And your brain has a hard time putting it together that this isn't a movie, that what you're seeing is real. And then what usually does it for you is the smells because you don't get that with a movie. You just see it visually and you understand that it's fake. But when you see it in person, it does look eerily similar. But once you take that inhale and you realize, oh, this is this is not a joke. This is not a movie. Then slowly your brain starts to process what you're what you're seeing. And 
it never, it's something you never get used to, but I can tell you I've never, well, have I? No, I don't think I've ever had a case personally where we had a decapitated head. I've had some bad accidents, motor vehicle accidents where there's been some, some things done some to, damage, to bodies, yeah. but, um, no, I don't think I've ever had that, but I have had some situations where uh, it definitely stays with you. You're in, like, as I'm sitting here now, I'm like, it's the flashbacks of it where it, it throws you even years later. So can't imagine walking into that crime scene. And it seems pretty apparent that whatever happened to Shad happened right there in that basement. Yeah. And I mean, when you, you know, when um, you're shocking the police officers on the scene who are, you know, the ones out of anybody who's going to be used to seeing the most. Right terrible things when it's when they can't even believe it when they're having a hard time really processing what's happening it, it's pretty bad and i mean it's pretty bad yeah. and you don't know this officer right it's green bay so i don't know what they're having a lot of this out there but even so the officer that showed up his name was what was it wanish you said yeah wanish wanish how much how many years does wanish have on is he fresh out of the academy is he, he looks 20 years young veteran? yeah he looked young in the video yeah. right so this could be something you get a situation where the guy's got six months on the job and he's walking into this, not what you expect. You know, they, they don't give these calls to the salty veterans. It just, and it's when it's your number is up, you go. And so, yeah, you could have a situation where this kid's a fresh out of the academy, fresh out of college, and now he's walking into a, to a crime scene like this. It's a tough pill for anyone to swallow, especially a young officer who knows that this could happen, but never thinks that it's actually going to. I know that's how I initially thought. And man, was I, was I in for a reality check. So because Shad was last seen with Taylor Shabiznis, different officers were dispatched to Taylor's apartment on Eastman Avenue in hopes of finding her and or the van that she'd been driving. Officers arrived at Taylor's apartment at around 5, 11 a.m. and their body cams recorded their next movements. Two officers walked up to the van they thought Taylor had driven and used flashlights to look inside. In the seat behind the driver's seat, they saw a crock pot sitting on top of a full laundry basket. At that point, they had no idea what horrors lay within that box. One officer then walked in front of the van and immediately noticed a bloody footprint in the snow. He called over another officer to take a look, and as they were checking the snow, the van's doors unlocked and its lights flashed, indicating that someone had used a key fob. They looked over towards Taylor's apartment entrance and saw Taylor coming out, wearing a black zip-up sweatshirt, black sweatpants, and a Chicago Bears hat. From the look on her face, she clearly had not been expecting to see them. One officer later said, quote, she appeared to be in shock or very surprised to see us. I'd equate it to a deer in the headlights kind of look or a child caught with their hand in the cookie jar, end quote. One of the officers asked Taylor if she knew why they were there. Now, it's difficult to hear her response on the body cam footage, but a later criminal complaint explained that she told them she thought they were there because of a warrant for her arrest, as she had removed her ankle bracelet. The officers immediately handcuffed Taylor, and while doing so, they noticed that her hands were bloody and that she had a deep gash on her thumb. One officer led her inside the apartment building and had her sit on the stairs while other officers went into her apartment. So the body cam footage didn't capture what happened next, but we know that when officers approached Taylor's apartment, they found the door partly open. Then Taylor's roommate, Scott Toms, came out of the apartment and was immediately detained and taken to the police station. Taylor was also taken to the station where officers took photos of the blood and injuries on her hands, which included that deep gash on her thumb and additional superficial cuts and scrapes. The officers also had Taylor remove her clothes, which were covered in blood, and obviously this blood was later confirmed to be Shad's. Taylor changed into a yellow paper jumpsuit, then walked into an interview room. I hate this fucking outfit. Never in my life. I'd rather be fucking <sighs> Clean the fuck up.
After Taylor complained about her new outfit, detectives came in and read her her Miranda rights. She agreed to talk and stated that she didn't have any mental health issues that they should be worried about. The subsequent interview lasted for six hours with several breaks, and one detective later testified that Taylor was cooperative and had a calm demeanor throughout the conversation. There were no outbursts, no mood swings, and she was open in her responses and her questions. The detectives explained to Taylor that they had been called to Shad's house where they discovered his decapitated head. Taylor's response was, quote, that's pretty fucked up, end quote. Detectives asked what happened to Shad and Taylor replied, quote, that's a good question, end quote, explaining that she had blacked out and she wasn't quite sure what had occurred. You gotta love the convenient blackout story. I've heard this in so many true crime cases at this point where The person's like, I mean, I don't know what happened. I blacked out. Never in my life have I blacked out. (laughs) And she's like, I have no mental health issues that you need to be worried about. But I just randomly black out conveniently when I've done something wrong and I don't want to talk about it. (laughs) Yeah, that's always when you don't have anything else. That's always the that's usually the go the go to for most offenders because they're never normally not going to admit to it. There's always that. Hey, listen, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. Yeah, I blacked out. out. (laughs) It's like. So Taylor explained that she and Shad had been using meth, which she referred to as the bitch. Taylor recounted that Shad had placed a chain around his neck so that she could choke him, which was something they had done in the past, I assume, in a sexual manner, something that they would do in bed together. When detectives tried asking Taylor some clarifying questions, she became distracted and started talking about Shad's head. Next, the detectives asked where the rest of Shad's body was located. I'm just like, shit, I think I went a little too far because, like, like I, I was blacking out while I was doing it, right? And then I thought, and then, like, I look at him, I'm like, shit, he's already purple. I'm like, but I'm, at, I'm like, I don't know if he's fucking. Is he good? Is he good? But then, like, when I woke up, like, you know, I'll, during the black I'm like, shit. Like, he was coughing up blood. I'm like, I don't know. I just kept on going. Like, okay. Sorry. You mean the kind you said that when you were choking, you were coughing up blood, you were kind of like, well, yeah, I'm going this far. I'm just going to keep going. Did you realize that by continuing that, that made you home? Oh, yeah, because I felt bad that he's like, because I'm like, damn, he's going to be losing that business. I'm like, I might as well just kill him. Okay. So you realize that by continuing that you may, you may actually kill him. Then. He was, I swear to God, he was telling me he's just like, just do it. So I'm like, oh, and I did it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Like, I swear to God, I'm like, oh, I, I, I'm like, I accidentally fucked up, and then I'm like, oh, I'm like, ah. Oh. And then, yeah, that's exactly what happened. And you, you, you also said that you enjoyed it, right? And I enjoyed it. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. What did you enjoy about that? I'm just... Was it kind of thrilling, a rush, exciting? Mm-hmm. What, what was the feeling that you got out of it? That's all I did. Um, okay. I, I, I'm just trying to understand what you were feeling. You're saying that you were yeah, like, so I'm just you know, did it make you happy? Was it just kind of exciting? Like opening Christmas presents? Like, or? I don't know. Like, this is, a, this is a thing that I have, like, I've always had, you know, like, you ever love something so much that it kills? Like, it, it happens to me. That's the feeling that I have. I love something so much that I kill it. Like, I love it so much and then I kill it. That's what happens to me. Detectives then asked Taylor to recount the events from the beginning, and she replied that she had spent the night of February 21st with Shad and AJ, and they were using weed and meth. After AJ left, Taylor said she and Shad shot up Trazodone and borrowed her roommate's van to go to Shad's mom's place. 
They went straight down to the basement, but before they even left the stairs, Shad produced two silver chains, which she described as being dog choke collars. Then they launched into the bed, and Shad put one chain around his neck, and Taylor began pulling, causing him to choke. Taylor told detectives there was no kissing or foreplay involved. She just got straight to choking Shad. According to Taylor, Shad lay face down in the bed, still wearing his shorts, while she, quote, rode him like a donkey, end quote, and continued to pull on the chain, choking him. She then went crazy. Taylor told detectives that she hadn't initially intended to kill Shad, but admitted that once she started choking him, she found it gratifying. She said that at one point she could feel Shad's heartbeat while choking him, so she kept pulling harder, but he didn't die easily. He resisted and fought back. Taylor said it took between three to five minutes for Shad to pass away, and after that, Shad was dead, and she cuddled and sexually assaulted his body for two to three hours, performing oral sex sex and using a dildo on him. Taylor explained that she didn't know what to do next because she couldn't just tell Shad's mom that her son was dead, so she, I guess, thought it was the better idea to dismember Shad using knives from the kitchen upstairs. That way she could take his body with her. Taylor said she moved Shad's body to the edge of the bed and used a nearby bucket and a blue storage container to collect the blood while she severed his head. Later, she emptied the blood down the basement shower drain. She placed the rest of Shad's body into the container and continued the dismemberment process. Taylor mentioned that she dozed off at times during the dismemberment and continued to engage in sexual acts with Shad's body while doing so. Is that also when you um, used the uh, dildo? Yeah. Yeah. Did you have sex with his body at all? At any point or any type of sexual contact? You know, obviously the dildo and stuff. I put the dick in his ass. Hmm? I grind it on and I put the dick in his ass. I, you grind it on? Yeah. Did you ever put his penis in your vagina? No. Okay, you just try it on Did you see before that you performed a roll on him? Yeah. Okay, and that's after he was dead? Yeah, yeah. And then, um, yeah, and then he got half of it. He was like half part while I was still sucking while he was dead. Yeah. Okay. Was that part of playing with him, or that is part of playing with him? That was part of playing with him. Did you? Uh, Actually, I was just I was severing his head while I was doing that too. Though. You were sucking his penis. Yeah. But when did you start? You know, cutting up his body. Wow, I'm like almost right away. I was sucking and cutting at the same time. Okay. But what about the rest of his body parts? Did that take all day? Did you? I was getting pissed off at the dismemberment process, actually. Did it take a while? Did it took a while? Yeah, because, like, I was nodding out. I was nodding out. Okay, so you're kind of sleeping, kind of nodding in and out. Um, have you taken any other drugs? I should have. I should have took drugs. I, should, I probably would have helped, but I didn't. And I just sat there. Yeah. Crazy. Do you remember um, it being daylight at all? When yeah, you're... when I looked at the window and I seen the daylight. And and was his body together still then? His body was not together. It's just like, oh. I had it fun with him for that two hours and then boom. So, but it um, took a while to cut the rest of the body up? Yeah. Okay. All messed up too much. We're going to take a quick break and then we're going to discuss what we just heard. <laughs> Morning routines in my house in one word chaos. I mean, I'm making coffee. I'm trying to make coffee. I'm putting pigtails in Bella's hair. I'm helping the kids pick out clothes. I'm making sure Aiden has his volleyball uniform. I'm doing everything. And I always feel like I'm actually doing nothing. But thankfully, the stress of breakfast, at least, is taken care of with Daily Harvest. Because with Daily Harvest, I'm getting meals that give me that quick, nourishing foundation for my whole day, and they're delivered right to my door. Daily Harvest keeps my stomach and my freezer full with options like fruit and veggie-packed smoothies, 
forageables, and lattes. They also have tons of options for any time of day like flatbreads, soups, and harvest bowls. My favorite item for Daily Harvest will always be their smoothies. I love how customizable they are. I can add protein powder, I can add collagen powder, and I feel like a smoothie works for any time of day. But they also do have amazing flatbreads. For instance, the portobello and pesto flatbread is so flavorful and so good. And with Daily Harvest, I get so many easy to prep options so I don't even have to think about what to cook for my next meal. And I love that I can skip the shopping, chopping, and post-cooking cleanup. By working directly with farmers, Daily Harvest secures the best ingredients and freezes them at peak ripeness to lock in that always-in-season taste and just-pick nutrition. What you see is what you eat. And when it comes to better choices, Daily Harvest makes it easy. They support farmers who invest in improving the biodiversity and health of our soil. Even their recyclable and compostable packaging, where possible, makes me feel like I'm making a positive impact on our environment. All I have to do is eat and enjoy. We love Daily Harvest. I know that Derek feels the same. Derek loves the smoothies and he's going to tell you how you can check daily harvest out for yourself yeah absolutely huge fan of daily harvest they've been with us almost since the beginning so make sure if you want to support us you support them and right now you can take the stress out of your mornings with daily harvest just go to dailyharvest.com slash crime weekly to get 65 dollars off your first box once again that's dailyharvest.com slash crime weekly for up to 65 dollars off your first box one more time dailyharvest.com slash crime weekly so this is crazy this is absolutely crazy like this person taylor shabiznes is out of her mind right because it's not like she just killed him she then cuddled with his body performed sexual acts on it used a dildo on him and then she was like well what else is there to do but chop him up Right. Which is so hard to understand how somebody who's never done that to a body before would just get right to work as if it was nothing, you know, just be laying down there two, three hours with a dead body. And then like, well, I can't put this off anymore. Where's where's my my saw? I need to start dismembering this body. Like, it's crazy to me. And this is like, once again, when people are on meth, they don't have a soul. (laughs) Like sometimes they don't have a soul because how do you do something like this? No, but I, I will say, although we can't comprehend it, it sounds like for the most part, she's being truthful. Oh, yeah. Telling, she's I mean, telling it like it is. Absolutely. She's, I, I, there's no way she's making all this up. I mean, the details that she's going to, to to add things to it that really don't change the outcome of the case. She killed him. But then to talk about the things of performing the sexual acts on him after his death, uh, not needed for, for this case. It's a slam dunk after she says she killed him. And that she did it intentionally. She didn't even say, hey, she could have went with, listen, he wanted me to do this. He wanted me to go rougher. And he he died from me choking him. I didn't realize it was too much. And then I severed his head because I was nervous and I wanted to dismember the body and kind of hide it. But no, she's saying, listen, there was a point where I knew I was killing him. I could feel his heartbeat and I got gratification from that and choked him harder. So pretty much I, I you have to, as terrible as it all sounds... Um, She's giving you the entire case and it doesn't seem like she's leaving many details out. Do you think that that's genuine, though, that she genuinely went into that not intending to kill him? Because that seems hard, hard to believe. Like, I believe her. If you didn't intend to kill someone and then you realize you're killing them. But at that moment, she did. So so my point being, it's not well, not even my point being she I think she's telling the truth where the the act initially, if we're to believe her. This collar's put on voluntarily by yeah. Shad. Yeah. And at that point, as soon as it's on, now she's in control. And maybe she didn't even know that that was in her until she started doing it. And obviously you add in there the meth, methamphetamine and that puts you, like you said, your soul leaves your body. You're a different person. So the fact that she's saying all this, and by the way, she's still probably high at this point because it's only a few hours after the incident. She's still covered in blood. She still has some remnants of that in her. So, yeah, I mean, it's very possible that she didn't go into it with the intention on killing him. But then when she had that feeling, the taste of blood, if you will, she couldn't she couldn't stop herself. Yeah. And I mean, still first degree murder, by the way. But hundred percent. But she's got um, meth, weed and trazodone in her system. Yeah. So she's crazy. She's pumped up full of stuff. And I'm really interested. Actually, I say first degree. But I am interested to see where this case goes because I could see a world 
where a defense team would try to not get murder one because of the condition of her mental state mm-hmm. and her saying that she basically lost control. I'm not going to, I don't know where this case is going. I don't know what she was charged with or what she was convicted of, but I am interested to find out because I feel like there's, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like there's going to be a wrinkle. Well, let's find out. Okay. Taylor told detectives that she used various bags and boxes she found in the basement to store Shad's body parts in. She said her original plan was to bring all the body parts with her, but she abandoned her plan when she, quote, got lazy and paranoid, end quote, which she believed was caused by the drugs. She expressed a particular affinity for Shad's head and initially intended to keep it in the bucket for safekeeping. However, she later forgot it and only took one or both of his legs. When questioned by the police about whether she thought killing Shad was justified, Taylor essentially stated that it didn't matter because she had killed him anyway. Wow. That's a level of self-awareness. There you go. (laughs) Damn. Following the interview, Taylor was taken to the hospital to receive stitches for the cut on her thumb, which she admitted was from dismembering Shad. Once she was back at the police station, Taylor met with the other detectives and answered a few additional questions for clarification. After the second interview concluded, detectives informed Taylor that she was going to jail, which she seemed to be surprised by. She said she hadn't realized that was going to happen. One of the detectives then asked her, quote, if somebody kills somebody and dismembers them, do you not think that person should go to jail? End quote. Taylor answered, quote, oh, fuck yeah. Yeah, this shit was fucked up. So, like, I don't even know. Like, I'm like, goddamn. End quote. It's the best type of suspect you could have. <laughs> I mean, this is great. For- it's like, yeah, that person definitely should go to, to prison, but not if that person is me. Like, goddamn. <laughs> but again, this is speaking even to more of what I'm concerned about here. Because is there an insanity plea here? Is there something that's going to come up at trial where this woman's going to get less of a sentence, even though this is a horrific case? You know, I'm not, we're not doctors here, but clearly there's something wrong with this woman. Yeah, it's called a meth addiction. uh, Meth addiction. And is there some type of mental illness there as well where she's going through something? So it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out at trial. Yes. So it's almost too good to be true as far as everything she's given. That's not a, normally you'll have some type of defense. She's like, hey, nah, man, this is messed up. What you got to do? <laughs> you are going to see some psychological elements come in during the trial, yes. The whole time Taylor was being questioned, detectives and medical examiner Dr. Vincent Tranquita started searching the basement for Shad's remains and other evidence. And ultimately, what they discovered did match Taylor's statements for the most part. First, they started with the bucket, which contained not only the head, but also a penis testicles, a kitchen steak knife, a pocket knife, a Jolly Rancher candy, a nail, and a shaving razor. When examining Shad's head, Dr. Tranquita noticed clear signs of strangulation, including injuries to the muscles in the neck and blood vessels in the face, along with chain indentations on the tongue. Next, they located remains inside a blue Jimmy Choo duffel bag on a dresser. Alongside the remains, they found plastic shopping bags, blood-stained Lysol wipes, and three kitchen knives, a bread knife, a paring knife, and a steak knife, all with red tissue on the blades and blood stains on the handles. The bread knife had once been serrated, but was now dulled down, and the paring knife had a bent blade, and the steak knife had a broken tip, later discovered inside Shad's body during the autopsy. On the same dresser, they discovered a dog choker collar, a glass pipe, and a bag containing 0.21 grams of meth, and near the beds, they found remains inside a pink and black Under Armour backpack. Some remains were loose, while others were wrapped in plastic shopping bags. They also uncovered remains in a blue rubber storage tote near the bed, which was covered with a blanket and clothes. This tote contained a carving knife, several internal organs, and Shad's upper torso with arms attached, which displayed cuts near the neck that matched those found on Shad's severed head. Dr. Tranquita later provided testimony about the further appearance of the torso. The back has been largely flayed and defleshed. In other words, the skin of the back has been removed. Also, the muscles of the back have been removed so that we have exposed rib cage. So, all right. So we just watched that clip from from the ME, but I wanted to also double back to the body cam footage that we had regard from the police officers. And again, if you're listening on audio, I will say this episode is probably going to be a little harder for you because, yeah, we have some audio clips, but the video is really what ties it all together and brings you into the crime scene. But 
It just gives you a better indication of like the layout yeah, what so you, you can were kind of visualize at. it while you're hearing it. Yeah. But what you notice on video is from this one particular officer, even the other officer as well, is it kind of looks like they're just standing around, not really doing much like they're there. Mm-hmm. But but what they're not doing is disturbing the crime scene. So yeah. later as they're going through it and actually processing all the evidence, that's when they're finding body parts and knives and all these different things that Stephanie's describing right now. And for anybody who doesn't know, that's the right way to do it. These patrolmen are there to preserve the crime scene for investigators. So although it may seem in the video that they're just kind of standing around doing nothing on their, you know, on their radios, calling for more people, they know that they're dealing with a murder. Mm -hmm. And the best thing they can do is move as little as possible. If nobody's in danger at the time, touch nothing and just ensure that nobody else now comes into that crime scene, including uh, the owners of the house, right? Nobody gets access to that. So their main job at that point is to now become gatekeepers of that crime scene, get a sheet going so that anybody who enters that area is signed in, signed out, et cetera. So could the officers have moved things around and found everything that we're describing right now? Of course they could have, but as a patrolman, that is not their job. And I'm glad they didn't because it allows investigators who are trained to do this to describe and document what was seen and how it was seen in a way that can then be relayed to the jury and everybody else who's listening in the in the right way. Yeah. I mean, it's just crazy. Like, I, it reminds me a lot. Remember when we did Joel Guy? I do. I was thinking about Joel Guy because that was one of the first cases we covered. So we were still in our rough stages finding yeah. each other out and stuff. But yeah, that was a very graphic crime scene as well. I mean, he, he went to a lot of lengths to hide his parents. He cut off his mother's head, put it yep. in like a pot on the on stove. On the stove, yep. Boiled, boiled, used acid. Yep, started dismembering them. Um, it, it's, it. T- I think it takes a certain sort of psychological state for a person to be in to be able to do this to somebody, not just somebody, but somebody they know, right? Right. Somebody that like with uh, Joel Guy, it being his parents. Like, how can you do that to your parents? You have to literally be completely turned off emotionally. You have to be so disconnected from reality, so disconnected from yourself, your feelings, your memories, that you're able to do something like this. And with Taylor Shabusiness, I mean, this was somebody she had dated for two years. This was somebody she had been intimate with, was currently being intimate with in in the moment of his death. And to just take his body and like tear it apart like this. And you you heard Dr. Tranquita talk about how his rib cage was exposed, muscles had been removed, skin of his back had been removed. She took some time to do this, man. Like, and, and don't you think it would have just been better for her? Because eventually people are going to find out, right? Like, you're dismembering a body in the basement. So there's going to be a lot of blood and you can't hide it all. You can't get rid of it all. You know, you could strip the the sheets. It's still going to be on the mattress, right? There's a lot of blood. So somebody's going to find out. And don't you think it looks better for you if you're just like, this was an accident and I'm sorry. And here is his body whole. And I immediately did the right thing as opposed to having a whole police investigation. And then, you know, you're the, the girl who not only killed this person, but dismembered his body. You know, my thing is with this whole situation and I don't want to like make it as vague as this, but clearly this is not a person of sound mind. This is not something that most people would ever do or would be able to do. Yeah. Right. They would, they would throw up and pass out before accomplishing this. So to be able to go through that. And like you were just saying, broken knives and tips and razor blades that were bent. This is someone who is being chemically controlled, Mm. right? And also probably has some underlying issues on top of that, Mm -hmm. um, which may be due to the extensive drug use or could be a deeper issue. I don't know. But yeah, no no normal human being would be able to do this and be able to do it without, again, (laughs) passing out in the process. Because like I said earlier, with the the sight, the sound, the smells, this is not something that that we can, that most people can process. So yeah, she clearly wasn't there and- and, and that's why we ended up with what we ended up with. But you and I won't be able to explain it because it's not something that we could go through and experience and, and be able to carry out. So and I think ninety nine point nine, hopefully 100 percent of our people here watching or listening feel the same way. You know, well, they're not going to admit it if they don't. Now that this is true, this is true. Feel so bad about themselves. Right. I mean, even the serial killers of the world like that do this methodically and do it over and over again. They're still of not sound mind, right? They're, the, the fact that they're doing those things means there's something wrong there. And so 
even though they might be more technical and surgical with how they do, you know, their murders and how they hide up the the cases that they are involved in, there's still something at, on underneath that's not completely right. And yeah, this is this is just a more graphic version of that where I think this is probably more of a combination where the drugs had a major uh, part in this whole thing. And it just finally, you know, being under the influence and having habitual use of this particular item, this particular product Substance. finally took their toll on them. Yeah. Um, I would even say, like, I've heard interviews with medical examiners, you know, who have to perform autopsies, who they said while they were going through, like, their education for this and in the first few years of them doing it, like, it was still difficult, you know, to cut in to a body, see bone, have to break bones at points to, to yeah. kind of get around things, things like that. Like, that was difficult for them. It took It took this becoming something habitual and becoming just like another day for them to not be nauseated by it. So to think that somebody did this and they've never done it before and they were able to do it without, like you said, throwing up everywhere or just blacking out, passing out cold – yeah. It's crazy to me, like, what state of mind was she in that allows you to do this? And if a substance can cause somebody to be in a state of mind where they are allowed to do this, we should really probably focus on maybe getting that getting that. Yeah, off I think the we've street. established meth is bad. But no, you're definitely right. And I think you and I have had some off the record conversations where – as when you're in the, the investigative division and you have a suspicious death, you have to be present for the autopsy as a de detective. And I got to the point and I never got past this really where knowing the MEs that were performing the autopsies, you have to be present in case they find anything mm -hmm. for, for trial purposes. But I was lucky enough where the glass screen was right there where they I'd go, you're going you're gonna to start? And they go, yep. And I'd go stand behind the glass screen so I wouldn't necessarily be hearing right up or, in it, yeah. or smelling any or anything that was going on. And specifically when you said it, the bones and stuff like that, mm -hmm. it is not pleasant. Mm -mm. And I never got used to it. And I can I have no issue telling you guys I had a few times where I had to run to the bathroom to, to, to throw up because yeah. it just I, I got a whiff of something. And it caught me wrong, and that was it. So, and oh, they, the, it. the doctors get it. The doctors get it. it happens all the time because they've been through it themselves. You yeah, know, they'll they'll pause. Hey, you good? You back? Okay, let's keep going. You know, yep, I'm good. You know, you're all masked up and gloved up, but still, uh, it's rough. Well, up to this point, the detectives and Dr. Tranquita had recovered all of Shad's remains except for a right thigh from the waist to the knee, a left thigh, and a left leg, so the search continued in the basement. They found blood staining on the mattress and a pillow and blood underneath the bed, along with a patch of concrete nearby that appeared to have been cleaned. Evidence of blood was also discovered around a stand-up shower in the basement with signs that someone had attempted to wipe it away. In their search, another chain was found on a pub table with a Pac-Man game on top, and a flesh-colored dildo was found inside a box in a wood cabinet against the wall. Later, the dildo was tested for Shad's DNA, but the results were inconclusive. They thoroughly searched the rest of the house, but did not find any additional remains. They did, however, note the absence of four knives and kitchen shears from a knife block in the kitchen. Continuing their investigation, the medical examiner and detectives proceeded to the police garage where Taylor's roommate's van was being stored. In the passenger seat located behind the driver's seat, they discovered a crockpot box on top of a full laundry basket. Inside the crockpot box, they found Shad's left thigh, left leg, and right thigh from the waist to the knees, still with shorts attached. The right thigh had the skin, soft tissue, and muscles removed from the bone. Next, Taylor's apartment was searched, and detectives took multiple phones, marijuana, and three syringes stuck together with a sticky substance into evidence. Blood was also discovered on Taylor's door and light switch. So she's leaving Shad's house covered in his blood. She doesn't even like wash her hands before leaving. She doesn't use that downstairs shower to clean herself off. She's walking out of the house. Her clothes are covered in blood. Her hands are covered in blood. She's got blood on her feet, obviously, because they found a bloody footprint in the snow by her apartment. She's got blood on her hands. She's walking into her apartment, turning the light on, getting blood everywhere. Yeah. And I th think about that, right? Again, she's still under the influence. Yeah. Even when they, they eventually come in contact with her, she's still clearly under the influence. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Because she's like, man, that's fucked up. I you mean, know, think, think about that interview she's <laughs> yeah. given. 
she's in there in a, in a jumpsuit. And the first thing she's concerned about is the conditions that she's in, saying she'd rather have cancer. Well, on March 1st, Taylor was charged with first degree intentional homicide, mutilating a corpse and third degree sexual assault. These charges carried significant penalties, life imprisonment for intentional homicide, 12 and a half years in prison, plus a $25,000 fine for mutilating a corpse and 10 years in prison, plus a $25,000 fine for third degree sexual assault. Shortly after being charged, Taylor had a bond hearing. ABC2 printed that she appeared calm and didn't say much except for acknowledging her right to an attorney. The prosecutor emphasized the seriousness of the charges and mentioned Taylor's ties to Texas, which could make her a flight risk. Furthermore, it was brought up that she had been on probation when the murder occurred and she had somehow removed her electronic monitoring bracelet. Doesn't that send a signal to the police the second you remove it or can you remove it without triggering that? No, I mean, there's probably ways of tampering with it that you can remove it and it doesn't trigger it. But uh, if they just cut it off, yeah, it, it automatically notifies the probation and parole department to let them know like, hey, she's she's taking it off or he's taking it off. But So I'm she sure, must have figured out how to remove it yeah, without. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think there's ways where I've never dealt with it, but there's ways where you can put some type of foil or something in there. So it's still in a, the contacts are still being made, mm-hmm. even though the something's being opened. Yes. So she's a a, a jack of all trades here. You know, she clearly if she had devoted any time and energy to doing something productive with her life, honestly, I think she could have done anything because she's able to do this horrible thing to a corpse that honestly, I don't know anybody who could who could do that without absolutely uh, wanting to die. And then she's just slipping out of her electronic monitoring bracelet with no issues. Career criminal. And she's, you know, listen, she's a criminal. She's hanging around with criminals Mm -hmm. in that space and you learn some things. Yeah, true. I mean, do you think you learn how to dismember a body? Maybe. I think that's just, I think that's just instinct. I think she's thinking, you you watch a movie or whatever, she's thinking, oh, I got to cut up the body. I wouldn't even know where to start. Like, I feel like you have to do certain things. Like, you have to, you have to do certain things. You can't just start cutting. You got to cut at certain joints. Well, that's why it's so sloppy. You know? That's why it's not professionally done. She hasn't done it before. She's in a situation where she just... Going with with her, going with her gut. If she's in a situation where she's just learning on the job. Yeah. So consequently, Taylor was held on a two million dollar cash bond, and Taylor was given the choice of two public defense attorneys, Quinn Jolly and Heather Richmond. However, she wouldn't decide between them, and as a result, Jolly filed a motion requesting a competency evaluation due to concerns about Taylor's ability to choose an attorney, among other things. Yeah, yeah. among other things. <laughs> yeah. The least being her ability to choose between an attorney. Mm -hmm. In mid-March, Taylor attended a court hearing via Zoom to discuss the competency evaluation motion. And during this hearing, the judge, Honorable Thomas Walsh, expressed uncertainty about Taylor's competence. He noted her demeanor, standing with crossed arms and only looking at the judge when asked if she was actively listening to what was going on. And ultimately, Judge Walsh approved the competency evaluation based on several factors, the contents of the criminal complaint against Taylor, her confusing decisions regarding her attorney, Jolly's doubts about her competency, and her limited engagement with the court during the hearing. Defense attorney Heather Richmond would end up withdrawing from the case, leaving Quinn Jolly as Taylor's sole representative, as her only choice, basically, so she didn't have to make the choice. Taylor was then sent to a mental health facility where she underwent an inpatient evaluation conducted by a psychologist hired by the state. And this would mark the beginning of a series of evaluations for 24-year-old Taylor Shabiznes because they, I think... I think that there was a lot to unpack there, and mm-hmm. it was going to take. This is what I'm concerned about. Yeah, it was going to take more than one about. evaluation for every, for everyone to figure out what the hell was going on with her. Yeah, no, I'm concerned. I'm not going to look up. I'm going to purposely not look up what's going to happen with this one. I've never heard of it before, but I am concerned. We know what happened, but there there is a real possibility here that. There could be some form of temporary insanity or I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen here. She's still going to be in prison, She's still, but she could be in different conditions mm-hmm. uh, because of her mental state. And I can tell you right now, the only thing that Jolly has here is men- temporary insanity or some form of mental illness that yes. caused this to happen. She's admitting to everything. She's articulating exactly what happened and all the evidence at the crime scene lines up perfectly. So more than likely... 
She's telling the truth. So all you can do is say, listen, she was not of sound mind when this happened. And clearly she's still not of sound mind as we sit here today. And they're displaying the behaviors or pointing out the behaviors that she's displaying at court to suggest that is the question becomes, is this just her scheme here? Is she just kind of playing this up knowing this is the only defense she has, or is this really her mental state? So that's why I'm interested to get to part two on this one, because it wouldn't be the first time we've had someone play it up from the time they're caught to the time they get to the trial Mm -hmm. where they're going with this mental incapacity and not able to make decisions and hopefully find themselves in a different situation than on death row. So we could have that here, but what's your thought? Do you, well, you know the whole thing, so I can't really well, ask you. Like as a spoiler alert, I will say she was declared to be competent Whoa. For, during her first evaluation, right? And well, then don't the watch defense, part two, guys. No, yeah, no there's just, plenty to talk about. And I'm then the kidding. defense was like, <laughs> the defense to the judge was like, "Are you freaking serious, man?" Like, yeah, I mean, I'm surprised by that. I didn't she, see it coming. Clearly, she's not right. And so then they they get another evaluation done by a psychiatrist that the defense chooses. And basically, even that psychiatrist is like, yeah, I mean, she definitely has like some drug problems and, you know, some a few other things. But I I do not believe that she didn't understand what she was doing at the time that she committed this crime. Right. So yeah, I guess that makes sense, too. Right. Like, yeah. mental, you know, mental illness and being under the influence of a narcotic or an al- or alcohol is not a form of temporary insanity that's just under the influence of a drug while performing a criminal act. So so did you know what you were doing at right. the time was wrong? That's the defense. Right. This might have yeah. enhanced your decision making process, right. but you were still of sound mind. Interesting point. Yeah. This is one where I'd love to have D- Dr. Mohandi on it because he is, in my opinion, one of the best forensic psychologists in the in the country. Well, I'm biased. Up, dude. Oh, he would do this in a heartbeat. We could do that. I mean, I don't think he knows the case, but I was literally talking to him today. Um, he's incredible. He's incredible. He's, I know, he's one very of the most smart. Int- he's very smart. You that's right. You've met him. He's yeah. one of the most intelligent people I've ever met in my entire life. Mm-hmm. Easily. Um, shout out to him. Go buy his book, Wicked Deeds. It's awesome. It's a shout great Shout out book. Chris Mohandi. Yeah, Dr. Chris Mohandi. He's interviewed some of the most dangerous people in the world. And the guy is he's squared away. I want he's got to do a podcast and I've been telling him that. But um I'm getting off the I'm getting off the path here. Wicked smart. Wicked smart. Wicked smart. Wicked smart. <laughs> Which is why his book's called Wicked Deeds. <laughs> Evil Thoughts Wicked Deeds, I believe it's called. Very cool. I got to read it actually. I have not read it. Oh, I'm sure he'll send you a copy. Yeah, I want a signed copy. Yeah, he can do that for you. He's he's great. He's great. Um, so, that's all I got. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's crazy. This, this case is crazy. We can always like send him the um the script for part two where it goes over this stuff and just get like his thoughts on it. If you want, I am totally down because he's been saying I got to because he obviously met you and stuff. I'm totally down to have him come on and do a quick sonata. Uh, he's very careful with what he does because yeah. he is an expert witness and he mm-hmm. testifies all over the country in right. some high profile cases that you guys absolutely know. Mm-hmm. Um, so he has to be careful because every time he testifies, he has some scumbag defense attorney try to discredit him Mm -hmm. to make him not an expert. So they'll use anything he's ever said in any podcast, whatever against him. If so, he, he's very cautious about giving his analysis on a case unless he knows all the factors. But if you want to, um, I mean, I I would, I'd be interested to know, like somebody's found to be competent, found to be basically in control and aware of their actions, can you still, because of the drugs, consider this to be like a temporary psychosis or a temporary insanity because of the I effect of the he drugs? He should be able to answer that. Yeah. He's not giving his expert opinion on the case, but as far Just as in overall. General. Yeah. I like that. Why don't yeah. we lock that in? We yeah. should do that. Lock it in. Let us know in the comments down below because we're gonna going have to have some time. Is he going to this year or not? I don't know if he's going or not, but I can always, I can call him and we can make that happen. No problem. Let us know in the comments down below what you think about that. You want to have Dr. Chris on weigh in on this a little bit because we're recording this episode before CrimeCon, little mm-hmm. movie magic here. We're recording it before we go so Shannon can edit it while we're there. Mm-hmm. And then you have a little vacay coming up with your family. Yeah. And then we'll be back from that and we're going to be recording part two. So you, we won't miss a week for you guys, no. but there's going to be some time before we record part two, which is ample amount of time for me to reach out to him and say, hey, can you come on for 10 minutes and just give us more of a perspective on as a forensic uh, a forensic psychologist, when you have someone who does something like this, but they're clearly under the influence of a narcotic, 
how do you how do you separate the two? Mm. How do you make that determination? I think that really would be a fascinating conversation. Well, it also goes back to like it was your willful choice to put right. that into your body, you know. That's true. So yeah. How how much can you blame? Like if I could take a pill and then uh, commit any horrible act I wanted and then blamed it on the pill at the end of the day, I still took that pill. You know, yeah. it's not like a magic cure all. It's not like, oh, uh, get out of jail free card. And if I was a prosecutor, I'd say, listen, well, how many times have you used meth? How many times have you used meth in your entire life? Oh, a couple hundred, maybe a thousand. Yeah, I, right. I think I read I, that she did it every, like she shot herself up like every day for like nine times a day. So Taylor, you used it nine, 10 times a day. How many other people did you kill while you were on it? Yeah, exactly. Oh, zero. So on this particular night, on this particular occasion, using the same drug you've always used, now you decide to kill him, but you want us to believe it was because of the drugs. Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think so. so. That, that's, the, that's the angle you go with. Not today. Not today. Um, any final words from you? Fascinating case. No, actually, I'm excited to record part two. So I am now, too, yeah. because now I kind of want to see how this plays out. And I think it would be cool to get Chris on if he can do it. Yeah, I do, too. All right. All right. So we're ready to go. Hey, guys, as always, we appreciate you being here. If you made it to the end of the video, please comment down below. Let us know what you think of the case. Let us know if you want to have Dr. Mahandi on. Spoiler alert, we're probably going to have him either way. Um, <laughs> but we, we appreciate all of you. Stay here. Like, comment, subscribe. We'll talk to you soon. Everyone stay safe out there. We'll see you next week. Bye.